This presentation is a production of the faculty of the Darden Graduate Business School. The aims of this presentation are to describe the philosophy of student-centered case teaching, survey foundations of effective case teaching, course design and choice of cases, norms or contract, infrastructures, preparation, opening and closing, profile some attributes of excellent case teachers and suggest paths of learning to teach by the case method. It's sort of a natural process that, that firms go through. And in when they get overexpanded, they lose value. And their share price may go down, profits may go down. You may, you may see a change at the top. You know, problems occur when they get expanded past their strategic logic. You have to exceed a, a, a high expectation that is based on nothing. It's based on bad accounting to begin with. So you're, you're, you know, you're driving yourself into a spiral that you can't get out of because you continue to have to ex take bigger chances. What fell, you know, what fell apart? Because it's a very dramatic rise, and we talked about some of the reasons why it makes some sense. Why did it unravel? Huh? They wanted speed. They always claim to be able to react fast. The deals, they don't look for outside competitors in their partnership. So they usually give the deals to some of the executives of the company to get that speed. You had to have ability, you had, and you had to have redundant ability to get the gas from Louisiana to New York. And since Enron was the first one to the market and they had the largest network, they were the most reliable in getting gas from point A to point B. And so they were creating value because they could make markets in areas where there may have been oversupply of demand. Effective case method is uh, above all else exhilarating. You can feel an energy in the room. There's um, a resonance. Uh, it's like basketball players when they describe being in the zone. The hair on the back of your neck stands up. You see students leaning forward. They can't wait to get in the discussion. They're asking questions of each other. Uh, instead of all eyes focused on the instructor, they're debating back and forth. They're listening to what others are saying and building on what they're saying and then questioning its uh, application in a variety of settings. The hour passes like it were an instant. I've walked out of classes where there was spontaneous applause, uh, not at the end of the course, at the end of a class, and, you, and, and, and I was on cloud nine thinking, that was so fun, I can't wait to get back in here tomorrow and hope that it happens again. Everyone's participating. You've got everyone's best thoughts and intellect being applied to a serious set of issues. People uh, at the same time have good senses of humor and it's uh, engaging and fun, and, uh, and it's intellectually stimulating. Yes, it's very stimulating. Uh, we're matching wits with extremely bright students, uh, and particularly in the classes where, they're, where they're, they've not become blasé, where they're really learning. It's such a pleasure to see their, their excitement and their knowledge as they, as they gain more mastery of the subject. And so it's a, yeah, it's a wonderful experience. The class just moves very, very smoothly. There's no dead time. Discussion just goes back and forth. The students are engaged, are excited about the class, and there's, there's no quiet time. It's a performance in the good sense of performance. You're creating something with the students. And if you, if you see it as a creative act, as opposed to I've got to get through this, or I've got a, I've got a, I've got certain material that's got to be conveyed in a certain way. Uh, I think it's a lot of fun. It's fun to create, and that's what teaching is. I think it's fun to create, but it's also really fulfilling to see judgment grow before your eyes. That's what happens in the case method. I don't think about it as teaching. I think about it as helping people learn. And if you're thinking about it as helping people learn, then the case method is just far superior to a lecture. The students are actively involved, and they're they're learning to they're learning to think through the problem for themselves, which is what you need to do to really learn something, and that's just a lot better than passively listening to someone else talk about it. Case method allows the instructor to begin where the student's knowledge ends. So we're not here in spite of the students; we're here because of the students. Student-centered learning um, is a phrase that captures my heart about a, a shared responsibility. 
And for me, the shared responsibility is to select materials that will capture the attention of the students and get forth some particular teaching points. So the first thing I'm doing is thinking about my responsibilities as a teacher to design a course and select material and in capture the hearts and minds of the students. The student-centeredness of that dimension comes when I have an expectation about what the students will do in preparing for class, what the students will do in the classroom, and finally, what I will do as an instructor to learn from that process as the students are learning from the process. Teacher-centered learning is typified as uh, how we traditionally teach in the United States. I speak, you take notes. And all discussion revolves around me. If, if you have something to ask, it's not asked to another student. It's asked to the front of the room and that instructor responds. So all, all conversation is either from faculty member out, from student in. And you take notes and I talk. And uh, nobody else is involved except the faculty member and the students are uh, in, involved only to the extent that they're listening and taking notes. Student-centered learning really involves making the students responsible for the process. And my role is, is much more one of uh, I don't know, the conductor, I guess, in a sense, of pointing to the appropriate student at the appropriate moment. Uh, that's student-centered learning. The responsibility is with them for, for the conduct of the class, for the, the direction in which the discussion goes, the depth to which it goes on various issues. And, and my role is one to, to nurture it along, to, to make sure that the, that the class is, is grazing on fertile territory, and, uh, and, then, uh, and then get out of the way and let them do it. Why case method in the first place? The answer is we want to enhance learning as much as possible. How do you engage a student to be actively mentally, emotionally, physically, socially in the learning process? Lecture method for me is a very passive kind of process. Case method encourages, invites, stimulates an active participation. It's going to be a lot more fun. I certainly find it much more involving and much more interesting to study by the case method um, because you really get a chance to think about um, the problem for yourself. Um, it demands much more creativity. Um, it demands independent thinking um, and using your intuition. I think it's primarily important because it challenges um, your reasoning. You're learning how to think. You're learning how to think through problems, the logic, the reasoning, and I think that that will carry you through any, anything you, you experience in the future. You want to be able to think the way you need to think to get to an answer in any given situation, not just the one you're experiencing today. You understand because they're doing much of the talking, where their heads are and how much they have actually been able to, uh, to do on the case and where gaps may be within their learning or within their thinking. Uh, and, and I think that's something that, that the, the lecture method doesn't give you that type of immediate feedback. It's really the best way to learn. And I can understand it if you lecture to me or lecture at me but I will learn the material if I've had a chance to discuss it, to argue it, to absorb it, to get involved in the process. Professional schools have two functions. One function of the professional schools is to socialize the student into the ways of the profession. But the second function of a professional school uh, is to teach a student to be critical, to teach a student to ask questions, to push forward, in our case, the practice and profession of management. Uh, in medical school, you want doctors to to know what it is to be uh, a good doctor, to, to, to use the right medications, to use the right treatment. But you also want a physician to question whether something is the right thing, to be skeptical and critical of what received knowledge is. Certainly that's the case in law school. Uh, it's a case in business school, I think. And that critical function can only be done via the case method. You can't teach the critical function unless you engage the students in that in the practice of doing it. Uh, and I think that's something that the, that the case method uh, uh, does pretty well. As Walter Riston once said, good judgment comes from experience. Experience comes from bad judgment. Because judgment can't be taught. Uh, if you're trying to teach um, somebody to ride a bicycle, they can only read about riding a bicycle 
for so much. At some point, you've got to take your child out and maybe with some training wheels or what have you, but get them uh, uh, practicing. The case method is about engaging students in real life situations and getting them to think critically about what the protagonist did and what they might do given who they are, their values, beliefs, and the assumptions that they're holding in the situation. And it's about allowing them the opportunity to compare and contrast their judgments against the judgments of other students. We talk a lot about the, the journey, not the arrival, as, uh, as an important part of case teaching. Uh, it teaches you about behavior. It teaches you how to put things in a context that allows you to be effective uh, and to learn in the process and to help others learn. Well, we're trying to teach, I think, a process of decision making rather than, rather than their ability to grasp facts because when you have, as we have students that, who average a 96 percentile on the graduate test, if you give them a formula and you give them some numbers to plug into the formula, they will give you the, quote, correct, unquote, answer. Our students uh, I think learn to develop a process and inter they they have a they internalize a process of decision making which uh, is far more important than any given uh, decision they might make in a case. There is no more efficient way to teach decision making than to teach it in the context of these. Uh, case studies which have constructive ambiguity which allow a range of, of uh, student thoughts. Well, I guess I, I've always thought of cases as having three primary uses. One is as, is as an example. Uh, and in that context you often teach some analytical structure or some concepts and then the case is, boy, let's see how this stuff works in the real world, but the, the focus is on the technique. The second is they are really formats for people to make decisions, often as we use in our MBA classes, and whether the technique helps or not uh, depends on the problem, depends on the, the issues of the day. Figuring out what the decision is is half the problem. And the third uh, way that I use cases tends to be more with executives and I'd say there it's almost it's more of a platform. Uh, they may not be interested in the decision facing you in this particular case but they are interested in the decisions that they face in their organization so the case is a springboard for them to talk about the issues they want to talk about. But in every case the common element uh, is that the case brings in a lot more than the theory or practice in those latter two examples. Uh, students learn a lot about uh, discerning what problems are, uh, learning what industries uh, are, what their particular features are, blending a lot of different elements into a decision where the analysis that I happen to teach in finance may or may not be as important as who your boss is uh, on that particular day. A good case has a certain amount of intrigue and drama. Uh, to it. It has a tension, something around which the case centers and flows. Uh, most often it's a decision to be made. The thing I came to value was what I will call constructive ambiguity. That is, if, if, if a situation is so delineated with assumptions and everything is specified, then it is nothing but a complex problem and the case setting is just artificial. We need enough ambiguity in the case such that reasonable people could differ over the assumptions. That then leads to a rich mix of, of alternatives and conclusions and recommendations which naturally flow from, from the uh, ambiguity. There are two senses of case that I like to use. One is the uh, the sense of a case in which it's a story about uh, things that happen in business uh, that always end with some decision to be made. And so you can start the case by asking the student uh, really what should you do and start with the decision and work backwards into any sort of analytical framework 
that comes from that. So there's a sense in which cases, uh, as we teach them here, are just uh, stories, snapshots about a particular uh, business or set of bu businesses, a, a slice in time. There's another sense of case, however, that again uh, goes to the idea of thinking of teaching via the case method as, as Socratic. And a case in that sense is just a text. Uh, whether that text is a poem, whether that text is uh, a work of literature, whether that text is an article about business, whether that text is even a, 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 a quantitative model in finance. Uh, teaching by the case method to me means uh, trying to take the students from where they are and elicit their views and do that in a way that 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 builds towards a shared understanding of something. Uh, another attractive feature for case method for me is the fact that an instructor can pick and choose materials to custom build a course uh, in the way they want to. You don't have to rely on a textbook and the author's framework. You can devise your own framework, put together some articles, technical notes, maybe chapters out of a book, along with a series of cases. My, my designs think, first of all, in terms of some modules. And then within, within modules, I really think in terms of a, of a learning process. I to say to myself, what questions do I want the student to ask? And what's a logical sequence of these questions? And then I, I try to find the cases to fit that. That takes time and that takes an understanding of case material that allows you to weave in interdependent stories that get you to where you want to go. And that yeah, case method is not just what happens in the classroom. Case method requires for it to be effective a whole surrounding support network, a structure, an infrastructure, if you will, a horseshoe-shaped environment is effective and if it's tiered that makes it even easier for people across the room to talk with each other to debate to disagree and so on everybody else is able to maintain eye contact with each other so everybody knows what's going on I, I find in normal classroom seating where it's row A B C D E you know just laid out like that that just, that just doesn't work because invariably you're speaking to the back of somebody's head while it may be interesting to do so it doesn't help the discussion the, the real inhibiting factor, I think, is when you get uh, multiple rows of people on the flat and they can't see past the people in front of them. So what's called the railroad style, or railroad car style, or classroom style, where you have ranks of people back, really ends up with the people in the first couple of rows participating, and the ones beyond that just can't get into the, can't get into the instruction. Uh, I was teaching just last week and, and arrived and discovered that the classroom was set up railroad style. So. The, the students and I quickly reset the classroom in a, in a, so it was in a U-shape, and I think it worked, worked much better. As part of the process of creating a good case discussion environment, the instructor should arrange the classroom to suit discussion. Here are two discussion-friendly setting arrangements for a typical lecture hall. Note that the bulky projector stand is moved out of the way, and flip charts are used if chalkboards aren't positioned conveniently. Another element of case discussion infrastructure is the use of name cards at each student's place. This builds familiarity and thus helps discussion. Some background information on each student is helpful. I think getting to know the students and who they are is really important. First of all, it makes for personal connection with the students. And for a lot of students who are used to a more traditional lecture style of learning, uh, they might be surprised that an instructor knows a little detail about them. The cards for me offer several bits of information. First of all, that gives their undergraduate major and the work experience. And that gives me a bit of an idea as to where the student may be vis-a-vis -vis the material of my course. Secondly, the, the work experience allows me to know how I might be able to, to use them in particular cases. And so when I first get the cards, I go through, I know what my case sequence is going to be, and if there are people who have worked for the company that's in one, that's in one, that around whom one of the cases is written, or in the industry in which that company is, is operating, then I note that, and when it comes around to that class, I find ways in which I might be able to, to use that student's expertise. Uh, that makes the, the learning experience much more student-centered. 
and uh, than if one didn't have that type of information. One of the grand ironies of being a teacher is that as you reflect back on your own learning experience, you know that you probably learned more from your peers in your educational programs than you did from your teachers. We as teachers really need to embrace that fact. In the case method, it makes sense to organize students into study teams who attempt to tackle the case before the whole class gets together to deal with the case. A learning team is an assigned group. Um, they're usually six or seven people that the university put together. Um, it's a diverse group, usually um, with expertise in a series of functional areas. And you meet every evening after having come home from class and prepared your cases. And in each person has to step up to the plate and explain to everybody else how they analyzed the case and what they did so that when you go into class you have not just your own knowledge but the power of the knowledge of five other people behind you. Some sort of shared understanding or social contract is crucial to the success of the case method process. Elements of this social contract would include full attendance, not skipping class, arriving on time, coming prepared to talk, or prepared to offer questions when you don't understand. It would include civility, the willingness to take risks, respect for diversity, but it would also include tough-mindedness and the willingness to challenge other students, the willingness to take risks in class. Ultimately, it ought to reflect student-centered process, the willingness for students to debate with each other rather than to simply adopt the passive mode of interacting with teachers. That we work very hard in a very carefully planned way to prepare new sets of students for dealing with the case method. We remind them that classes uh, will start on time, that attendance is mandatory, that it's not just what you take away from the class, but what you contribute to the class that makes it an effective class. So uh, if you're gone, it doesn't mean that you, not only didn't you pick up what you should have picked up, it also means that you weren't giving the benefit of your experience to the rest of the class. So Case Method has uh, not only benefits, but responsibilities. I try to reinforce the point that, that we aren't going to be slack, we aren't going to slough off, we aren't going to, in my class, we're not going to skim over the top. We're going to get to the root of what's there. Uh, it means uh, creating a an environment and an atmosphere where the people that uh, are part of that environment uh, have a common goal, a common commitment, uh, and will be willing to work towards some objectives. We have to have some shared values. We have to talk continually about how we're doing and uh, what we can do to improve. Uh, we have to be willing to work well together. Uh, we have to like each other uh, most of the time. Uh, we have to be tolerant and patient. Um, and uh, we, have to, uh, we have to be prepared to continually revisit uh, some issues and uh, re-energize ourselves. That this is really a, a learning team and that all of us, the, you know, the entire class as well as myself, are part of that team. So one thing that everyone has to keep in mind is to respect everyone's uh, everyone's right to contribute and to allow others the opportunity to contribute something unique. Um, things that uh, that we do our best to guard against is being too repetitive, um, saying something that another student had said before, because that just eats up time um, that's very valuable when there's so many different points of view to, uh, uh, to be given. Also, um, it's important to try and focus on the issue at hand because there's so many different issues um, that each student may be focusing on a different one and you're desperate to try and you know get your your one great tidbit in but it's very important to remember that there's a, a proper time and place for that and if a discussion is moving along very smoothly you don't want to interrupt that particular issue um, with something that's not related to the present discussion beginning of every course, I typically take five minutes and I say, look, let's, uh, I ask them what they've heard about the course, and they, or about me, and they write that down. And then I suggest to them that these are, in fact, other people's experiences of the course and me. They're not theirs. 
and could we please leave those on the board somewhere else because it's not their experience it's just what they've heard and so let's try to do something you know firsthand ourselves then what I asked them to do is to say what if we're going to have uh, a number of conversations that make a difference versus conversations that don't make a difference distinction I like what do we have to do to have a great to have a number of conversations that make make a difference what do you have to do what do I have to do what do we have to do and we talked about that for a while and then I asked them quite simply how can we screw it up right and I I get somebody to write those down and uh, then I type them up and, and, and get them Xerox and hand them out to everybody at the end of the course we go back to them and we say how do we do you know do we screw it up sometimes we do did we do what we said we were going to do? Is there anything you'd add to this? So what are you learning? I, w I want the students to learn not only about the subject matter, but I want them to learn about the way that they learn. And I think if you carry on both those conversations at the same time, or you're responsible for both those conversations at the same time, uh, you, you can make a difference. What I have is a one-page summary with the questions that I want to ask, uh, and I just lay that on the desk. For me, preparation is or are questions rather than answers. Case method instructors will often have a game plan. They'll have a series of questions they want to ask that will lead into a particular conceptual domain. They may even have thought through what their boards are going to look like. I think the very least amount of preparation um, is to have articulated a set of core questions that you would like the students to wrestle with. And ideally, the answers to these questions would allow the student and you to focus on what you determine to be your teaching objectives. Going into a class, one should have identified why they want to use the case. What are the teaching points that they want to bring out? What are the two or three um, critical issues uh, or points or whatever that want to be brought out, that need to be brought out by that particular case. Um, then have a series of questions um, that try and get at that conversation. Um, I personally prefer less structure going into a case conversation than more structure. I might go in with one page of paper that has a list of questions and what I think will be a reasonable amount of time to spend on that question. You're putting this together with an eye of what's going to happen in the classroom. Now you can't predict what's going to happen completely, but you still need, need to have a sense of what a student's going to do with this and what are the possibilities that they can learn from this, the kinds of analysis they can do. What... I just take the material and go through it as if I were one of the students and see what I get and how I think about it. And then I talk with one of my colleagues and then I go over uh, teaching notes or talk with other colleagues to answer whatever specific questions we have and then I sit down and think about for myself just what what it all might look like and I make one page of notes that says these are the big these are the big themes of the conversation and these are the three or four sometimes two maybe five on a really ambitious day if we're talking about the case for the first time that I've taught, uh, I will go in over-prepared, which is probably one of the worst things you can do because you'll, you'll start thinking about, I've got to cover these points. That's in contrast to a case you've taught multiple times where you're a lot more relaxed and you'll go with the flow of things. The first thing then I think about in, te in going into that class is, how am I going to keep the over-preparation from getting in the way of what the students want to talk about? And at the same time, how to create at least enough of a structure where I get my teaching points across. That then implies that I am cautious about over-preparation at the same time being fully prepared. I'm cautious about it. I'm secondly, I'm aware of what I want to accomplish that particular class. The third thing that I do in terms of preparing for any class is make a list of students that I think are going to be resources for the class. Sometimes that resource is based upon experience, sometimes it's based upon students that have wanted to get into a previous conversation but, but couldn't because of the time constraints or the other flow that was going on. 
And sometimes that resource list of students is because it's time to get a student into the class discussion that I haven't heard from in a while or haven't heard from at all. The, the advice that I'd offer is advice that says go with the flow. If you're going to go with the flow of the discussion, you have to trust the process that it'll ultimately get to where you hope it might go. Preparation is not a serial process where I lay out at, at time zero, it'll be this, and at time 15 minutes, it'll be that, and so on. Uh, but rather, it's a, a process that has loops in it so that you can start someplace and maybe skip ahead and then know how you're going to get back to an issue that you thought might have been an issue to be addressed early, but in the student mind, it might have been something that didn't occur to them early on. So it's very much a, a process that has loops in it and, and, you, and you ultimately get through the various issues at stake. Uh, great teaching notes are really a productivity tool for the faculty. So if you've not written the case and you've not watched someone teach the case before, the best thing to do is to call upon those cases where there's some great teaching notes either from the files of a colleague or from the published teaching note itself. The first thing, therefore, a brand new case, um, how much time do you have available to prepare? Because a lot of it is about preparation. What do you have in your mind that will open up a number of possibilities for the students in the class itself? Second thing I think about in terms of teaching a case for the first time is where does it fit in the flow of topics that I have outlined in my mind as the anticipation of where the students will be on that particular day. The third thing I think about in terms of a brand new case is am I going to be able to say something about my own process of learning at the conclusion of that class? Does it in itself excite me to the point that I'm going to learn something? So I'm constantly thinking about what am I going to learn from teaching this brand new case for the first time. How you open the case method discussion is very important. I like to focus on drama. I like to bring it down to the level of the manager to keep things from getting too abstract. And I like to open with a cold call. Usually, my opening question, if I haven't got something more elaborate, will be to say, well, Mr. or Ms. X, what is the problem in this case? How have you analyzed it? And what do you recommend? Uh, but where you want to start is, is, is very important. But to avoid yes or no questions. Uh, try to get questions that have to have an essay answer rather than a, a yes or no or multiple choice uh, answer uh, because often you cold call and the student says yes and, and then what do you do? Uh, so so uh, having, having uh, uh, phrasing questions so that they are open-ended uh, is, is I think very important in the cold calling process. I cold call because it helps the energy in the class but I don't cold call in the coldest of manners. I do what we call a warm call. I walk in and usually say, in a moment, Mr. Smith, whoever, in a moment, John, I'll ask you to, to open. And then I talk about something else for two or three minutes. So I want the energy of the fresh call, but I don't want the, the tension of I haven't gathered my thoughts yet. I cold call because it raises the level of the game. I like to close the case discussion in any number of ways either with a vote of the class, a summary by a student, or a final recommendation by the person who opened with a cold call. Once in a while, I'll present the epilogue of the case, what really happened. But I don't do it too often, because I don't want students to get into the mode of thinking that what I say, what happened, is really what ought to have happened. And this is consistent with my general belief that the professor shouldn't, as a rule, present solutions. This robs the student of sorting things out for him or herself. To close every class out, I believe, is a mistake. I think it's a mistake because you get in the mode that students expect an answer closure from every class. I don't believe the case method operates on single sound bites of individual classes. The case method operates on a couple of class pulling together the thoughts in a learning environment where the students, as a result of those two or three, 
will be better off in their understanding of a situation or a tool or a framework. I want the students to think for themselves. At the risk of them saying, uh, there's no closure here, we never come to any closure, I'm going to demand that the students think for themselves. I'll tell them what I think some, sometimes. I'll tell them even what I think of the case if they want to know. But what I'm really interested in is what the students think the closure is. Having them come to some closure. I can cite all the academic literature and lecture and all that sort of stuff for them, and sometimes I do that. But I'm, I want to be sure that it's in the context of them thinking for themselves, of them putting the closure on that, rather than looking to the authority figure to do that. That's what student-centered learning is about. That's what really taking responsibility for your own learning is about. The executives are not quite as willing to take the return question and what would you think. They really want to grab you and say, what, you're the expert and we're paying you <laughs> to come here. What do you think? So you're obliged to give a, at least some sort of uh, conclusion to pull it together, I think, in an executive program. No. If, in fact, we're trying to build leadership capability in our students, we want the instructional experience to prepare them to ask the right questions, to make meanings for themselves, and to make meanings for the others in the room. Case method offers a great opportunity to do that. A good case method instructor will help the students discover the process whereby they can make their own meanings rather than receive the meanings that the instructor may have in mind. Because there are all kinds of effective case teachers. Uh, they're the, the, the warm fuzzies, they're the cold pricklies. Uh, the, 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 they can all be effective. I think probably the least effective way is to try to be something you aren't. Um, and, and you really have to run your class in the, in the manner that, that suits your personality and your style. Uh, I, I personally like to see an instructor who, who can avoid making anybody be fo feel foolish. I like to see an instructor who, even if a student is making a serious mistake, can somehow turn that around so that the student and the class learn without the student feeling foolish. Sometimes with, with very bright students that get off the track, uh, it's easier to just tell them they're wrong. Uh, whereas I would be very hesitant to tell that to a weak student. I much prefer to have them have the positive experience of thinking their way through the problem and coming out on the right side. Uh, I also think that the, a little bit of humor helps. I think humor is important. I try and inspire the curiosity of students. Good case teachers are excellent framers of questions. They can uh, look at a set of ideas and figure out the right question that will stimulate a lot of discussion. They care a lot about their students. They care about what their students are learning versus what they might be missing. They care about differences in learning styles. They care about the quality of the students' minds enough that they want to hear what they have to say, how they're approaching a situation. You really and truly care about what students say. I've seen really good case teachers who, um, how shall we put this, intellectually others have, su have surpassed. Uh, but because they were engaged in the students and what they said, um, they were great te te teachers. Students respond uh, very, very favorably if, if they really, really feel you care about them and you can be trusted. Uh, and that, that isn't to say you can't work them hard, you can't push them, you can't hold them accountable. All of those things are out there, but it's, 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 trust and, it's trust and caring. It's anticipating where they are. It's anticipating uh, where they are, not only in terms of the, what their learnings are, but where they are emotionally and where they are ready to uh, dig in and, and take something new on or, or stop and reflect upon where they have been. Bad case teaching is uh, guess what the instructor wants to hear and guess what the answer is. Anyway, I actually model the behavior that I, that I look forward to. I think they maintain a, a certain tension th through the class. A uh, tension of, of perhaps a search for the uh, uh, depth of analysis, uh, continually pushing so that they 
the, the class doesn't uh, sort of sit back and, and, and relax. Uh, the, the visual result of that is a lot of people wide awake and sitting on the edge of their chairs and listening very intently in, uh, at each other. Uh, Tough-mindedness, but not tough-heartedness. That listening is, is an essential quality. Uh, if one is going to, to be able to, to guide the discussion and to be able to orchestrate the class, you need to have listened carefully to what each and every student says. And, and in addition, that also respects their contribution to the room. And I, I think that's an important part of this learning environment that a case discussion represents. Everyone's opinion is, is, of, is of equal value. And some may carry a little more weight and may take the discussion a bit further. But everyone needs to be listened to, because you never know if this might be the day, the moment that suddenly they open up a an, a an idea that no one in the room has thought of or you haven't thought of. Listen carefully. Good listening is the heart of the case method because you're listening for not only what they say but what they're trying to say. What they, where the questions are, how the student's thinking, and how it fits into the overall conversation. To be a damn good listener and to listen to the various comments without the trouble of style. Here's what I mean by that. We are accustomed to listening to the very forceful, clear, articulate, loud-speaking individual. And many times we find in our diverse student-bodied um, classes that there are people that need to be heard because their comments are just as good but don't say them in the loud, forceful way. So listening to a, through a variety of styles is important for me in effective classroom uh, discussions. The second thing, in addition to listening, is the ability to change the pace of a class. A class that is all run and gun, top notch, boy, this is fun, cannot be sustained through 15 sessions or 20 sessions or 30 sessions. So the pace of the classes across the course has to change, as well as the within a class discussion itself. Pacing the emotional ups and downs, sometimes is as important as what is actually being taught itself. So listening and pacing, pacing. The third dimension of a really effective classroom teaching activity is the ability to acknowledge either at the moment or in a follow-up activity of what's working well. We all learn because we're in an environment of, of being challenged, but we need to have behaviors that are reinforced by follow-up comments from the faculty, either within the class or at the following class when you see a student in the hallway or you can drop them a note. Pacing, listening, follow-up, they're all important attributes that, that challenge us. It's the willingness to go where the class needs to go. Flexibility, I walk in there, every class has a fresh experience with 60 new people and you don't know where it's gonna go. And that's the excitement for me. There's comfort with the process. It's, it's enjoying what's going on in that room. That, that this is not a chance for, for, for the instructor to, to show her or his expertise, but rather an opportunity to engage the students in, a, in, in their own learning. Uh, and I think that just shows when, a, when a, an instructor is, is, is excited about what's happening, when an instructor engages the students in, in, in that learning, uh, it's just fun. And I think that there's a, there's a sparkle that comes with it. The faculty member actually believes that she or he is going to learn something from that session. Trust the process. Much of being, I think, an effective case teacher is trusting the process. And that uh, you have to believe that the students will ultimately get to the place where you think they ought to be. And they may not do it through the route that you have in mind. And uh, they may not do it as quickly as you'd like to have it happen. But ultimately, it's going to happen. And, uh, and you just have to believe that. And as soon as you start believing, I think it starts happening. The case instruction is an art form. 
and and therefore there are no checklists that one can uh, can appeal to. Uh, and on the other hand, I, I think it is something that can be developed, and it can be and it's developed because you you really care to develop it. I think and uh, it takes it takes a uh, introspection after every class. In fact, still today, after every class, I think about what I what I did, what I might have done differently. And I write notes into a into the the, the case folder, uh, so that the next time around, I'm able to sort of learn from the most recent experience. I think it's a never-ending kind of process. I think that as good as you are, there's always something to learn from somebody else. I learn little techniques that my colleagues have to offer, and I think I'm a better teacher as a result of that. But you learn by a lot of practicing. Practice, uh, as. Uh, uh, the fellow who took the taxi cab and said, how do you get to Carnegie Hall? And the driver said, practice, practice, practice. The same thing is true in teaching. In the first term, first semester that I was here, I sat in every instructor's class, uh, every instructor on his faculty. I sat in classes, talked to them about what they were doing, talked about them prior to classes, talked with them prior to classes. I sat in on practically every class I could. Um, and so I learned a lot about how to facilitate a conversation. I went to the Harvard Business School where I began studying with cases and, and had a required course in teaching technique, pedagogy. I had a good coach and mentor. And I learned by working with two faculty colleagues, uh, one teaching a subject area that I knew very deeply and a lot about, the quantitative analysis course, and a second um, that I knew from experience. So it was a matter of taking something I already knew and figuring out how to make the best of it. Well, I had the advantage of, uh, of, of uh, having about, what is it, about 400 case classes on that other business school up north and being able to observe a lot of different styles of, of, of case teaching. Yeah, Bill's really been a mentor to me, uh, both in case writing and in case teaching. Uh, Bill always sends me notes and, and uh, debriefs what he saw. And in fact, one of the ways I, I get better as a teacher is reading what he saw that I might not even be aware that I'm doing. And that's quite insightful. It started with, a, with Harvard offering a, an, an afternoon of instruction to their new faculty by some of the great gurus of the case method. And I went to that session and, and I, I took copious notes and then I went back and I thought, okay, now how do I prepare this first case for my, what they called managerial economics course. And then, uh, uh, and, and I mean, I followed the instructions and I went into class and it was terrible. Uh, I walked out and I thought, man, I must have missed something in my notes. And so I then uh, reread them and indeed I found a couple more things and prepared the second class and it wasn't much better than the first. And so it went for several times and finally after about four days I decided this can't go on like this. I mean, there's, you know, there's a whole 60 course, uh, session course ahead of me, and, uh, and there's just no way. And so I thought, well, I'm just going to go in and do what feels natural. And from that moment on, things started to, started to pick up. And, and it wasn't until about a year later that, that I discovered that the, the faculty who were doing the introduction taught marketing and business policy. And the way one uses cases in marketing and business policy is very different than the way you use them in, in a uh, quantitative analysis course. And I guess that was sort of the, op the opening for me to really think about cases because it, I, I started to realize that, that they are unique to the, the individual faculty, to the particular collection of students that are gathered for that course, to the, to the content, to the objectives for a day. And so therefore, they're, I stopped using the word the in front of case method and just referred to and began referring to it as I use cases and I use them differently within a course. I use them differently with different, with different groups of students. My colleagues give the sense that what's crucial to the case method process is adopting a student-centered mindset. This means such things as a willingness to listen rather than tell, a willingness to guide rather than to control a discussion, a willingness to grant the students some measure of responsibility in making the classroom venture work. It means creating an environment where students talk to each other rather than just talk to the professor. It means creating a social contract 
of civility and yet tough-minded challenge. It means choosing case materials that are appropriate for the students rather than materials that reflect what the teacher wants to tell. And ultimately it means that the teacher himself or herself needs to become a learner. I can't think of anyone who said it better than the philosopher Soren Kierkegaard. To be a teacher does not mean simply to affirm that such a thing is so or to deliver a lecture. No, to be a teacher in the right sense is to be a learner. Instruction begins when you, the teacher, learn from the learner. Put yourself in his place so that you may understand what he understands and in the way he understands it.